Well, hello, my name is Steve Evans and I should have been with you speaking today, but unfortunately I'm not well uh, and unable to travel. So we've put together this video that hopefully will replace my talk and possibly be a bit more entertaining. It starts with a piece that I did in May for BBC Breakfast that features your very own Sam Turner and sets up the purpose of this talk. Talking openly about dying is uh, something that many people are not comfortable doing really. In fact, one in four people over the age of 75 have not discussed their wishes or planned any sort of end-of-life care. Steve Evans was forced to face his mortality when he was diagnosed with terminal stomach cancer. Just last month, he appeared on breakfast to appeal for funding for life-prolonging drugs. Despite his situation, Steve was positive. John Maguire went to meet him. Well, it's nice to see you. Thanks for coming. So this is the garden. This is the tree, which will soon shed and give me another job. And this is the fabled summer house. Spend some time with Steve Evans and you step into a world filled with family, laughter and magic. What was the card, my friend? Six of hearts. You should have told me. <laughs> that will be that one then. <laughs> no, I don't think so they could I don't think they could watch it all again. I don't think they could watch it all again. As well as performing as a magician, he was a chief building surveyor at Wolverhampton City Council, a manager at the Civic Hall concert venue, and helped to run huge music festivals, but was forced to retire by terminal stomach cancer. In October 2011, he almost died, and at that point realized he'd made no plans for his death. I could only think about the fact that I'd let people down. And irrational things were coming into my head. The fact that I'd left my study in a mess. For them, other people, my family, to tidy up. And I'd got nothing in place. They didn't know anything that I wanted. And my life's got so many different facets in it. That wasn't logical, surely. And I concluded that it's because I simply thought that my responsibilities didn't end when my physical life did. I couldn't give it any more conclusion than that. Steve takes me to one of his favourite places, the Wolverhampton Civic Hall. This is one of my happy places. Me and the Civic have got a lot in common. We're oldish, a bit broken and loved. And I'll settle for that. So this is where I live spiritually. Because when you've got a happy place, you can be anyone you want to be. And when I'm here, I don't have cancer. Good, isn't it? For a man with so many friends and such a full life, the reality of his time running out has been incredibly tough for everyone. But I think it's how you approach it that, that, that is the solution. Because um, you, I don't think there is a template or a framework for, for discussing your final days. I think it has to be how it works for you and your family. How it works for me and my family they let me get on with it, and I know if they weren't happy, I would have been told. He has now made plans, meticulous plans, for his funeral and for the lives of those he will have to leave behind. I found the writing of the document to be very stressful, and I cried a lot. But once it was down, uh, it was down. I'm a person who plans, and I've found solace in putting incredible detail into my document. But it doesn't have to be that. I think it's whatever people want it to be. Spending and enjoying time with Steve Evans is a life-affirming experience, but he knows his life, still as precious as ever, is now near its end. John McGuire, BBC News, Wolverhampton. Watching that with us, Sam Turner, director of Dying Matters, which is the group which aims to improve people's knowledge about dying. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, it's Steve, a shining example, really. Of well, hasn't he done his job, uh, my job for me <laughs> this morning? <laughs> Can I it, just well, yes. um, say that um, I spoke to Steve last yes. night, and I think viewers will want to know uh, two lovely pieces of information. One, um, he uh, found out on Friday his tumours have shrunk, Brilliant. which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. And to today is his birthday, so oh, we should say well, happy, birthday. happy birthday. Yes. Well, a lot, a lot of people have got in touch with us this morning to, to tell us how inspiring they find him and his story. But it's interesting what he said there, that writing down the detail 
was incredibly stressful yeah. and very upsetting. And perhaps, although he found the courage to do that, that is one of the things that people, that encapsulates how people think about dying, yeah. isn't it? Absolutely, and I think nobody's pretending that these conversations or making these plans is, is easy mm. in any way. That's why Dying Matters exists, to try and help the people that want to do it. And we've got all sorts of information and guidelines on the website and films and things to help people make their wishes. But actually what he also said was um, that once he'd done it, it gave him great peace of mind. And he, Steve actually got a chance to do it when when he was dying and he realised the importance and he was quite lucky yeah. in, a, in a funny so way because then he went went on and made his plans and now he's he's got them in place he can yeah. get, there, a, there get on with the rest though, of his life. There is naturally a lot of fear of, of death and some people probably may feel a little bit squeamish about it in such a thing if I start making plans it might make it more likely to happen yeah. early you know what I mean tempting fate in that mm. respect. Well. It's such an odd thing, isn't it? We're so terribly British about these things and there is a lot of superstition and taboo around it and we, we do kind of think that if we talk about it, it'll happen and somehow if we don't talk about it, it won't happen. What, and at what, neither age should you start, at what age do you think you should start thinking I think about the, the sooner the better. All so my, have you made a plan? All my plans are in place. Really? All my plans, all my family. You know, I sort of work in the business so I should do. <laughs> Uh, but actually, it becomes much more difficult to do once you are ill, I think, to have those conversations. And, yeah, to think about it, because none of us know. None of us know what will happen. We don't know what's going to happen, so how can you plan for something you don't know? Because, for instance, you might be, you know, you might suffer a stroke, you might have terminal illness, and in those two different cases, you would want to be treated in... or you possibly would want to be treated in different well, ways. Well, absolutely, and... and but that's the reason to plan. So what we're asking people this week to do is have a will, incredibly important, to not leave people in a, in a mess afterwards, um, plan their funeral or their wishes for their funeral, um, think about the care and support that they would want. And of course it'll change depending on, on what happens to you. Mm. But have it, it's an ongoing conversation. It's not one that you do and it's set in stone and that's what will happen to mm. you. But actually, if you were to have a stroke tomorrow, wouldn't it be wonderful if the people that were important to you knew your wishes mm. and well, could carry them out? Be not necessarily wonderful, but it'd be a relief to them. It would to be have an a idea. relief to you yeah. and to them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's lovely. Thank, thank you very so much. much. Thank, thank you. you. Let us know what you think about that. 28 minutes past seven. So that was May this year. And I think it says a lot of what I wanted to tell you in my presentation. But more has happened since then. Up till that point, I'd had two quite shocking experiences where really I'd nearly passed away. But let me give you a bit more detail about our journey. It started in September 2011 when I was breathless and didn't know why. Doctor told me I'd got an ulcer. So I had an endoscopy procedure to have a look at the ulcer and they found a tumour, a tumour in my stomach. A CT scan a few days later showed the extent of that tumour and unfortunately it was what is called T4. It had migrated to another organ, that other organ being my pancreas. So unfortunately I was quickly told that I couldn't be cured, that treatment was only palliative. Effectively, I was going to die. That's not a good day. But the story gets better. I was told at that meeting, the not very good day meeting, that we had a lead oncologist called Professor Ferry. And do you know, when they told me his name was Ferry, I really hoped his first name was Brian. It turned out to be David. I was gutted. What can you do? But we also found out that he was one of the world's leading authorities in keeping people with what I've got alive. I mean, what are the odds of that? And when my wife found out, all she could say was, what's he doing in Wolverhampton? Well, I'm just glad he's there, to be perfectly honest. So, it was decided we would have chemotherapy 
And it was during that chemotherapy course, running towards the end of 2011, that I had the two bleeds that were referred to in the piece that has just been shown. And that's when I had those experiences. Lying, holding my wife's hand, you know, it wasn't nice. And at the time when she wasn't with me, I was genuinely mithered. Mithered about illogical things, like the state of my study and the fact that nothing was in place. And as you heard, I got better. And I then set about putting things in place. And when something very similar happened again at the end of 2011, I felt much better. I still wasn't particularly happy at the concept of dying. I'm not good with that. We'll come on to that in a second. But I was less minded. I was more at peace. And that is the simple tale of where we were up till that point. Now, I am known for being able to talk quite openly about cancer. Let's explain that. It's because um, that isn't the full picture, is it? Because I've got cancer, but, but uh, it's the other thing. It's the terminally ill thing that isn't good. Dying. And we don't talk about it. And isn't that the issue? The issue is we don't talk about dying. I am aware of the fact, and I still don't do it, and I'm not very comfortable doing it now, to be perfectly honest. We talk about the cancer. The cancer is, as I said, a, a version of being at work for us. It's just something that needs to be managed in order for us to continue living. But we have got everything in place. So let us bring the journey up to date and deal with where we are today. Because the reason that I can't travel down to the London is because I'm experiencing bleed number five. That's a lot of bleeds. Bleed number four, which I'm going to talk about now, was a beauty. You see, in 2013, we had to revisit treatment called Second Line because at the end of 2012, to a greater extent, the tumour had grown back. It was to be expected. Under cover of the effects that are various of the chemotherapy, the tumour had started to bleed again. You see, the problem with anyone who you encounter who's on a cancer journey, these things are so difficult to appreciate and understand because they are so variable and they change all the time and the side effects associated with chemotherapy are imaginative to say the least. I now can't eat very well due to the problem with my esophagus but that started during treatment where everything tasted of sour milk except milk that tasted fine. So what can you do? I used to, I was a chocoholic, I was known, quite famous for stealing children's chocolate. My own children's chocolate, obviously. I have my standards. Now, can't touch it. What can I do? Other than, <laughs> as I'm losing weight, buy slightly smaller clothes. But I digress. What we're talking about here is where we are now. Under the cover of my second line chemotherapy treatment, which was funded by the Cancer Drugs Fund, towards the end of it, I started to bleed and that was affecting my blood so I was having to have blood transfusions but no one was quite sure why. All of my aims were to attend a magic convention in Buxton, Derbyshire at the beginning of September and I did and it was a wonderful week and I achieved everything I wanted to. But to get me there the previous week I'd had to have a number of days in hospital so I could have five units of blood. I was obviously very determined to get there. But it was a great success. But our strength lasted just till the day of the main event at the convention, which was the Thursday. On the Friday, I started to deteriorate. And on the Saturday, my uh, breathlessness increased. My energy levels dropped. And on the Sunday when we came home, I did little more than sleep. Monday, I went into hospital with a HP level of 5.2. I know, it's very low, very low. Something of a ward record. Not that I'm proud of such things, but they did say they wouldn't understand if I bought myself a trophy. I haven't. But if anyone wants to chip in, just a thought. So, what happened was, I uh, 
immediately went into hospital and they saw that I was bleeding profusely. But what had also happened was that my tumour had grown into my esophagus and had completely closed it. So I couldn't eat, I couldn't swallow and I couldn't drink. Nothing but, but water and ice. But it was bleeding. The tumour was bleeding but it was bleeding in a concealed place that they couldn't get to. You see it was doing its job, it was bringing the journey to a close. It was killing me and it wasn't a very nice experience. So during that week I slowly got worse and they decided, because they're geniuses, they do know what they're doing, that the way to stop the bleeding was to give me a controlled blast of radiotherapy and this is what they did and that was on the Thursday but Thursday night everything was shut down and I felt that I really had come to the end of my journey. So I had the conversation with the person that isn't there because I'm not particularly a person of faith but when you're in this position believe me you do do a lot of thinking and I simply said to someone who couldn't be seen look if there's nothing more to do can I go now because I'm broke and, and I, my family know all of my friends know and there's nothing else I can do but if there's something else I need to do let me know and I'll do it other than that I want to go now so I went to sleep full of morphine on that Thursday night thinking that I was simply going to pass away four hours later I woke up I could swallow the radiotherapy had done its job and I was getting better I've got no idea what's happening have I I thought I was dying I was actually getting better I'm hopeless at looking after myself it's a good job I've got my wife Septina to be perfectly honest but that left us with four or five days where I during that period stopped bleeding and I had to get stronger and then came out of hospital but I was still left with a question a very private question why have I got this? You see, it's, it, there are two versions of the same question. Why have I got cancer? Is the positive. The same question asked in the negative is why me? Luckily, I've never had that. I've never seen it from that viewpoint. But it's understandable, isn't it? But my view is very simple. I must have it for some reason. I may never know exactly why. But some very amazing things have happened in the last couple of weeks and it is this that brings me to the end of my talk. So I've now experienced four bleeds and three very near misses, very close shaves and I'm at home and I'm thinking about what's going to happen, what the future is. We, we've let everything go now, we, we're completely retired, we know we're in the last phase of the journey and we don't know how long we've got but we know in the time that we've got we're going to spend it relaxed and with friends. So I've retired from all of my hobby things really although I still try and veer back to doing some of them and coming to do your talk is one of those things but you can see my health really does seem to control everything. But I got a call from the BBC saying that um, the government were going to extend Cancer Drugs Fund, the CDF, by two years. And when I go on to breakfast television on the Saturday morning to talk about it, and I discussed it with my professor, he said, do it. So I did it. Before I went on, I was in the mailbox in Birmingham using their studio because they hadn't got anyone to come around the summer house, which is... This, by the way, I hope you like it. You can't see much of it, but it's all mine. Um, and we were at the mailbox and we recorded it. Before I went on, I, I checked my Twitter account because due to media that I'd done with my friend Richard Bacon, I had got 1,800 followers on Twitter. When I came off the telly, I checked again just to say on Twitter, I've now finished the interview, and I've got 11,000. Can't quite understand that. So... The amount of people that are now following me and are talking about my journey and are sharing the journey with me and say the most loveliest of things, perhaps that's the reason that I'm still here. 
So I have a, a Twitter handle, if that's the word for it, at Steve Evans 51 It's a way the world can get in touch with me. And to be honest, it seems to. And then it wanted me, the world of Twitter, to write a blog. And I didn't know what one was, but so I had a go. And some of the things I've written in the blog, people with condition who can't verbalise things as I do, they have actually taken my words to explain how they feel. And that's incredibly humbling. So perhaps that's why I've got this condition. Because I'll keep looking for the reason. And if the reason, the final reason, is to be able to sit here, although at a distance, talking to all of you, well, I'll settle for that. Although I can't see any of you, I really hope that you've enjoyed or got something from the last 20 minutes. Uh, I've enjoyed recording it. And if I could have been with you, I truly would have. But thank you for all the work that you do. It really is appreciated by people you will never meet. And one of them is me. Thank you. Good night and God bless. Ta-ra. How do I turn this off?